Hi, my name is Bianca Pashola. I'm the CEO of SIX and welcome to the Challenger Exploration Live Investor Summit. I'd like to start today by introducing our presenter, Chris Kanor, CEO and Managing Director of Challenger Exploration. To kick things off, we'll be playing a recording of Chris telling the company story, and then we'll, we're gonna come back on live to accept questions. Uh, you can submit your questions in the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen. So without further ado, we're gonna disappear, but we'll come back on shortly. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. And I'd like to thank um, all of the investors for uh, jumping on. I'll uh, spend about 25 minutes walking you through Challenger Exploration, and then we'll have some time for questions uh, at the back end. Now, that cover photo is our uh, Walilan Gold Project in Argentina there, the mineralization outcrops in the hills, and we're drilling out under the plains now. Great uh, logistics in the area. I'll click through to the summary. So Challenger... Um, sort of key outline, we've got two projects, uh, both complementary. We've got a high grade advanced gold project in uh, San Juan in Argentina. Uh, been locked up in a dispute for 15 years, so it's seen no modern exploration. This is an historical resource there of 627,000 ounces at 13.7 grams gold. Now sort of upfront, um, if you look at the average grade of all the drill holes, it's about 10 grams gold equivalent. So when we do come out with a jork resource, it will be in the order of 10 grams gold. That historical resource is a little high, but having said that 10 grams gold is still a, a very high grade uh, gold deposit. In Ecuador, we uh, picked up a concession about 18 months ago, you know, some fantastic scout drilling, I suppose you'd call it, done by Newmont, intercepts of 156 metres at two and a half grams gold, over 100 metres at half a gram gold, half a percent copper, in sort of vertical breccia pipes that really were never followed up. Uh, we spent about 600,000 US doing some geophysics because the key with a porphyry system is how deep is it? And then really when we saw the geophysics, we ran silent until we consolidated uh, all of the ground in the region. We've just sort of completed our first hole where we've got 134 metres at a gram a tonne gold, 4 point gram silver, including a high grade core. And basically, we now think we're onto a very large gold system in Ecuador, a large bulk deposit. A uh, little bit about the company. Uh, fully diluted market capitalisation at about 200 million. And uh, in terms of the major shareholders, uh, myself, I own 10% of the company. My chairman owns just over 5% of the company. And you know, we've got some significant skin in the game. I've paid you know, a couple of million dollars for my shares. My chairman put in about $1.3 million at 10 cents in our last raise. Uh, my background, I'm an exploration geologist by uh, training, worked as an exploration geo, then got into the markets as a mining analyst and really was sort of an investment banker for about 10 years. I jumped out eight or nine years ago, got control of a little shell. We put uh, some Saudi Arabian assets into it. And five years later, after going through a DFS, we were taken over for a billion dollars. Fletcher, who was our chairman, he was the founding chairman of Citadel with me. And Scott Funkston, who's my CFO. Scott, I've uh, managed to pick up after Avanco Resources, which was a startup in Brazil. Scott was the founding CFO. They took that through uh, exploration drill out, DFS and into production, and they were taken over by Oz Resources for about 500 billion. So, you know, the three key management team all understand what it takes to uh, take a startup and then turn that into a big corporate exit. And that's the plan here. Uh, so I'll talk about the Hewley and Gold project. Um, you know, I've discussed the historical resource. Um, you know, key here is we sit in San Juan province, which is a tier one mining jurisdiction. You've got um, barracks sitting there with Veladero, which is in production. You've got London Group about to start production on Jose Maria. Fortescue have uh, just picked up some stranded porphyries in there. Very easy place to work, you know, very good system. We get our drilling approvals through in about three weeks. Um, our tenure, we're on granted mining leases and we've applied for and will be awarded the 26 square k's around it. But, uh, you know, we could start mining in three or four weeks if we wanted to. It's pretty simple metallurgy. The gold, actually, you get 80% of the gold and silver out into a gold-silver concentrate. We're redoing the metal metallurgy now. It hasn't been done for 20 years. We hope we'll get a little bit better than that. But again, at 10 grams a tonne, 80% recovery, you know, the project will be lowest cost quartile. Uh, this good infrastructure, we sit uh, around about 400 metres from a double-lane sealed highway. We've got uh, you know, regional power lines being built within two kilometres of site. Having said that, though, you probably still run with diesel unless we find a porphyry underneath, which there may be. And uh, we're only a thousand metres elevation, so you can really work all year round in the field. 
And sort of what's happened since we started drilling, the original strategy was to go in there, um, get a small scale plant in operation, maybe do 50, 60,000 ounces a year out of the historical resource. After our first bunch of drilling, we've realised this system is open in all directions and you know, is a large system. So really now there's been a strategy change where we need to drill this out now and find out just how big it can be before we look at production scenarios. This is the style of thing we're seeing. This is a cross section um, from you know, one of our recent holes. Um, we've actually picked up a bunch of assay results late last night that uh, should be out to the market pre-open this morning. So I'm free to talk about them. Yeah, you know, the style of thing we're seeing, that cross section shows a typical sort of body. The two blue holes are our holes, that, that red hole, hole 24, we're waiting for assays and then some more proposed holes. You know, the, the kind of results you typically get here are, you know, six metres at 34, six metres at 14. Yeah, this is from our first uh, bunch of drilling. In terms of where we are now, we've uh, drilled 36 holes. We've now got the first eight back uh, this morning. We finished some metallurgical drilling and there's another 50 holes that we'll drill. So you'll have continued news flow for really the next sort of three to four months. And, you know, just on those first holes. So, you know, look, we've got a great batch of results. Hole 20, we've uh, got eight metres at 21 grams gold equivalent, including a high grade core in there of five metres at 26 gram gold. That extended the mineralisation 40 metres along strike. Hole 18, we've got 3.8 metres at uh, 12 grams gold equivalent. That extended the uh, mineralisation another 25 metres along strike the other way. And then some drilling down at the south where we've got, you know, nine and a half metres of mineralisation you know, averaging around about seven grams gold equivalent. So, you know, a really solid set of results this morning. All eight holes have intersected mineralisation and it just confirms mineralisation is open in all directions. And this gives you a picture of what the ore body looks like. Uh, this is the mineralisation in 3D. Yeah, so there's two distinct halves, the northern half of the deposit and then the southern half of the deposit. These drill results this morning from the southern half of the deposit. And what we see is basically two sets of sort of loads. You've got east-west faults, which are the magnata vein and the Sanchez vein. They're very deep faults. They control the mineralising fluids. The fluids have come up those faults and then intersected the limestone units, which are soluble, and replaced those with sort of dipping lenses of massive sulphides. And, you know, if you look at the historical drilling, most of the historical drilling was just done under the old adits and shafts. They were just chasing assay results. As we're now stepping this out, we're finding that you know, these loads are tending to join and look like they do want to join. It's not going to be continuous, but you know, that's two kilometres of strike there. There's been one hole drilled in the middle of those two loads that intersected a metre at a gram gold almost and two gram silver. So, you know, this is a very big system and really the only thing holding it back is drilling. And this is just the same sort of area, but we're looking at a plan view, so looking straight down. The key takeaways here are the green are basically the you know, potential fertile structures, the east-west faults or the um, limestone units. The red dots are where we have actually identified mineralisation in the field. And the little yellow blobs there, that is the historical 600,000 ounce resource, only down to 125 metres open everywhere. We've pushed it down 50 metres in three or four locations. We've got a couple of holes that have pushed it 50 metres along strike. So, you know, again, we'll know how big this system is in 12 months. And it's really just a case of now we need to get in here and drill this thing out on 40 metre centres and find out whether this is a million ounces or bigger. And hopefully it's going to be a lot bigger than that. So again, just to wrap up, so that photo on the right there shows, you know, the actual Hewlian outcrop. That little sort of red area, that is that 2K you know, explored extent. If we come sort of about 500 metres down to the south, to the right, there's mineralisation outcropping there, which has never been looked at. There's sort of four or five kilometres of, un of unexplored strike to the north and the south. 5Ks north is another similar high-grade gold deposit, which is not ours, but, you know, that whole trend there, you know, if this was in Kalgoorlie, it'd have a couple of thousand drill holes on it already, down to a thousand metres, and we'd know how big it is. So, look, your key milestones that are coming, you know, what we will release this morning is basically eight of about 80 holes, so 10% of the current drilling program that will be done in the next three months. Uh, we've sent the samples off for metallurgical test work, and, you know, again, when we look at the MET work, the sort of key for us is it doesn't look like there was a fine enough grind done, so hopefully we'll get better than 80% recoveries. But if we don't, it's still going to be a low-cost operation. Um, you'll get a jaw compliant resource later on this year, and really that is just a factor of, you know, we've got a lot of work here to make sure that we capture as much as we can in this first jaw resource. There's nothing worse than putting out a 
resource that we know will be much larger. And then really, you know, assuming we keep drilling for the rest of the year, which is the current plan, you'll get a second resource towards the right at the back end of the year as well. Now, I'll talk about our Ecuador project. So again, I've mentioned some of these historical resor results, you know, wide all grade intercepts. And, you know, this drilling was conducted by Newmont. And when we have a look at the drilling they did, we know that none of the Newmont personnel ever went to site. You know, you've got a couple of holes there that ended in five grams a tonne gold mineralisation. We look at half of their holes and they look like they terminated you know, too shallow for the target they were aiming at. And there's three or four holes there, the first four holes where you've got widths up to sort of 250 metres at almost half a gram gold, visual chalk pyrite or copper ore logged in the holes, never assayed for copper. So it's just your typical, you know, big company didn't pay attention to detail. And again, you know, what we did is we've done some detailed surface mapping, soil geochemistry and geophysics to uh, get a feel for how deep the uh, potential porphyry targets are. Um, this is the sort of, you know, the model. So what you see here in the middle, are, you know, the, our high grade results sit in intrusive breaches. That's 20 million year old intrusive breaches, diorites, porphyry diorites. If you have a look to the right, the Kang Rios project, that's owned by Lumina Gold. That sits 10 kilometres along strike. It's now a 17 million ounce ore body where they've just finished their pre-feasibility study. It will do 400,000 ounces a year at $600 all in sustaining. And that sits in exactly the same 20 million year age, intrusive breaches, diorites. You, know, you look at the scale of that in the red circle and we have one drill hole in the middle of our higher grade drill holes. We've now identified some more breccia pipes in there. So we've potentially got a, a Kang Rios style target and then the porphyry targets below. And if you look to those three holes there on the, the top right, they're those three holes where there were, you know, big widths of chalcopyrite in the holes that were never assayed for copper. And, you know, that is indicative of what you see above a big porphyry system. You've got copper leakage from the system. If you just sort of bear that sort of model with the three porphyry targets in your mind, I'll then go through. This is the, our um, first east-west line of uh, geophysics to the same target, and you can see there in purple, you've got these three deep porphyry, well, not deep, you know, they're 250 metres square. So you're looking 300, 350 metres from subsurface. It looks like, you know, what we're seeing here is the tops of the porphyries are chargeable from the uh, pyrite. So, you know, again, you know, this is a, you know, big sort of system with three big porphyry targets. Now, having said that, as much as these are great targets, I'm not naive enough to know that when a junior explores for a porphyry system, they generally don't find it on the first hole, they find it on the 21st hole. And if you're drilling two to $300,000 holes, that is a very easy way to destroy shareholder value. So the plan here has always been spend the majority of our money on the Hulian project, where we will end up with a big high grade resource. And then once we've sort of generated a re-rating for shareholders, then we'll raise a decent chunk of money and come back and then you know, drill out these properly where we can afford to drill 30 or 40 holes. And if they're not there, you walk away. And you know, this is just another target we've got. We did two IP lines, um, IP sees chargeability. And the reason we only did two IP lines is basically we weren't sure there would be anything here within 800 metres of surface. So you can see these three historical holes here that got over 100 metres at half a gram copper, half a, half a gram gold, half a percent copper. And you go sort of 200 metres down dip, you've got a big chargeable, chargeability anomaly that's three times wider, three times more intense, which is that 24A and then 24B. 24C is another sort of similar chargeability anomaly that doesn't look like it gets to surface. We've now gone up and had a look at surface in, you know, see what, what we can see in outcrop. And, you know, while that intrusive breccia doesn't get to surface, all of the fractures up there on top of that hill above 24C are all stained green and blue with copper. So you've got a significant copper source below. And, you know, as part of tying in the uh, geophysics with the uh, drill core, we measured the uh, chargeability response in all of the core and really what you see is a fairly straight line relationship between the chargeability response and the grade and it's a simple factor of you know more sulfides more chargeability more grade so you would hope there that again you know that that's a world-class target you 300 meter wide sulfide body that's you know, both of those 24a and 24c 100 million ton envelopes but again that sits on a 60 degree slope 
and the risk there is that you know, the signal's a little smeared, so we'll go back in and do a 3D IP grid over there so we can really pin down those targets before we drill them. Again, you know, I don't want to risk shareholders' funds unless we've actually done you know, the best job of defining them. And now I'll sort of get on to, I suppose, what's been the game changer for us in Ecuador. The concession there in the red is the original concession we had. As soon as we saw that geophysics, we started to increase the footprint. We've now picked up that uh, pink concession to the north. Now that concession is held by some artisanal miners. They're producing about 10,000 ounces of gold a year. And look, they told us in the um, yeah, in, in our DD and our meetings that they had porphyry mineralisation on their ground. They told us that in a sector porphyry mineralisation in their drill core, they'd never assayed. They said they had 120 metre exposure in one of their declines going down to the high grade gold of what they thought was porphyry. And um, you know, basically during DD, we've sort of jumped on and had a look and this is the style of thing we saw. That drill core there, you can see that's a typical porphyry B vein with chalcopyrite in there. Uh, that exploration added there, we've mapped about a 300 metre exposure of porphyry mineralisation. We had just our panel sampled the top sort of 30 metres of that, and the panel samples averaged about a gram and a half gold, some silver, 0.2 copper, before uh, the COVID shutdown over there. Now, we started again two weeks ago, so we're back on the ground. But, you know, they're two great targets. And then, you know, they've also got almost 60 historical drill holes where basically they'd assayed bits and pieces of them for gold only where they thought it was high grade. They were effectively chasing feed for their high grade mill. I mean, we jumped in and had a look at some of the drill core and saw what we thought were really wide zones of potential mineralization. And, you know, we've announced about a week and a half ago, we reassayed the entire first hole. And, you know, that was done on the basis of it was an interesting looking hole, by no means the best, but it was the first hole we had to hand. And, you know, it confirmed we've got a big gold system here. You know, that hole went 150 metres at 0.9 grams gold, 3.8 silver with a higher grade core of 134 metres at a gram and then 60 metres within there of 1.6. So, you know, it is a big system. We've now got, it's actually seven more holes that we've put in for assay. We should hopefully get three or four more holes back in the next two weeks. And really now the field work will all be focused on relogging these remaining holes. So, you know, we'll send them in and, and re-log and then assay these holes over the next sort of you know three to four months and that will give us a good picture of what we've got just some sort of regional work so this is the soil geochemical work they did you've got these big traditional a b c d and e gold copper and moly soil anomalies that look like they could be porphyry targets and then where this hole was drilled it's sort of south there's no geochemical you know signature you know there's a cluster sort of drill holes there where they've chased this sort of structure that I think the artisanals were mining. And the logical question there is, you know, why did they drill it? It, it clearly isn't the you know, where you would want to put a drill hole if you're chasing a big sort of porphyry target. And, you know, this just gives you a closer look. This is a cross section on the right showing that sort of discovery hole. And, you know, when we look at the core, it's not a traditional porphyry body. Uh, it's less than 1% sulphides. There's a strong correlation of the gold with antimony and arsenic and bismuth and tellurium. And it looks like it is in a really big shear zone. The fault over that sort of 150 metres is all chopped up. It just looks like a very big regional fault structure. You know, in many sort of senses, it's actually similar to an intrusion related gold system more so than a porphyry. And, you know, just the context for that type of intercept. So, you know, Fort Knox, reserves of 300 million tonnes of 0.43 grams gold. You know, they're producing 200,000 ounces a year at $1,000 all in sustaining. Dublin Gulch, you know, they've got reserves of 150 million tonnes of 0.6 grams gold. You know, they'll produce 200,000 ounces a year at, at 774 grams all in sustaining. And I know they're both heat glitch operations, but I could have equally spoken about um, Lumina Gold's King Rios project, which is about seven and a half kilometres northwest of this one. Where you know they'll treat their you know, they'll treat their ore through a mill. They'll produce a gold copper concentrate, and that'll do 400,000 ounces a year, $600 an ounce, all in sustaining. So the key takeaway is, you know, that intercept there of 150 metres of 0.9 is eminently economic. And I'll just zoom in on that. So what we're seeing here is the historical drilling done by the artisanals, and we've overlaid it on a gold in antimony anomaly because the gold here is strongly associated with antimony. And what you can see is that, you know, the current drilling they've done defines a zone about 500 metres long, 200 metres wide, defined down to sort of four, 500 metres depth and open. You know, you very quickly build up 80 to 100 million tonnes in there. 
And then more importantly, if you go sort of to the bottom right, there are two sort of larger antimony in soil anomalies with coincident gold anomalies that are both, you know, almost a kilometre long. And, and that is the main regional structural trend as well. So, you know, there is a, a lot of follow up here. And, you know, the aim here is that we'll get a very big system. It's not going to be two grams a tonne gold. It will be sort of, you know, a gram or maybe less. But again, if you get enough of it, that kind of system is very economical. And, you know, so look, in terms of, you know, go forward plan in Ecuador, it's really all about assaying these 56 core holes for the next, you know, three or four months. We will probably then jump in and twin a couple of these holes just purely to see what we then can get into a, a jork resource very cheaply. And, you know, this you know, will not break the bank. We've got six million cash at bank at the moment and everything I've spoken about here is covered by that six million. And we run into December with, you know, one and a half, two million in the bank. You know, what we're doing here is we're reassaying core at $25 a metre compared to drilling holes at $300 a metre. So, you know, you should hopefully we'll get a nice big uplift out of, you know, this in the next three to four months you know, sooner. So again, just to sort of summarise you know, our aim, like everyone, we want to become a significant you know, gold producer. You know, why can we do it? It's really, to be honest, we've just got lucky. So what we've got is we've got a high grade resource that will produce you know, a really low risk, high cash flow in Hulian. You, know, you sort of roll forward to where we've got a million and a half ounces and that's doing 150,000 ounces a year. That will effectively fund the company and fund development of a large lower grade gold system, which might end up being a three or 400,000 ounce a year producer in El Guabo. And, you know, what do you see for the next three or four months? You've got continued drilling results, continued results in Ecuador, metallurgy resource, you know, constant catalysts and news flow to hopefully see the stock re-rated, you know, uh, very quickly over the coming sort of, you know, starting in, in one or two weeks. So, look, thank you very much for your time. And I will sort of happily take any questions now. So let's jump right into it. We have a few questions here. The first question we have is uh, from Warwick, and uh, he wants to know, when do you expect uh, Wallyland Gold results? Yeah, sure. So look, Warwick, um, good news is we'll actually be putting out uh, the first eight holes this morning before the market opens, and you know, which means I'm free to talk about them. We've got some great pits in there. We've um, got a result of 8.3 metres at 21.1 grams gold equivalent on the magnata vein, which pushed the magnata vein 40 metres along strike. There was a high grade core in there of 25 metres at almost, uh, sorry, 5.5 metres at almost 30 grams gold equivalent. Uh, hole 18, we've got almost four metres at 12 grams gold equivalent, and uh, that's on the magnata vein, pushing it 40 metres along strike the other way. Uh, then uh, hole 16, we've got a, a nine metre intercept there, which is um, averaging around about seven or eight grams, grams gold equivalent. So, you know, there'll be eight holes out this morning, and we're very pleased with the results. Excellent. Uh, another question here from Hugo. Hey, Hugo, actually, I, I remember you from earlier today. Thanks for, for showing up to uh, Challenger Explorations event. Uh, he wants to know, how is your cash flow? Okay, so cash at the bank at the moment is just over six. And uh, where we land doing everything that I spoke about in the presentation is we run into January with between one and a half and two million in the bank. So we're, we're fully funded for the rest of the year. And, uh, you know, we've then got enough cash left to um, basically either continue drilling, which is the plan, or have some breathing space so that really we're, we're not sort of out looking to raise money at the moment. We've got enough um, cash there to do the program and re-rate the company before we look at that. Awesome. Uh, Andres wants to know about Ecuador's property. Is there still artisanal mining activity in the project area? If so, what plan do you have to deal with them? Yeah, um, no, there's not artisanal mining in the project area. Uh, when we arrived, there were about 150 artisanal miners. And uh, look, we were a little bit sort of sneaky. We worked with Arcom and basically had the concession changed over from a small scale mining concession to um, basically we had exploitation banned and we've left it open for surface exploration. So we've now cleaned out all the artisanal miners. And um, yeah, a lot of those guys who were artisanal miners are now working for us, um, yeah, moving core boxes around in a field assistance. So the community is quite happy, but no, we, we have moved out all the artisanals, which can be a problem in Ecuador. Great. 
Question here from Jim Carl. Uh, what is the plan to mitigate the risk of the government coming in and nationalizing the mine or very heavily taxing the mine more than currently expected? Uh, yeah, look, in, in terms of, I suppose, Argentina, no risk at all. I mean, the new president uh, is, you know, okay, he came in on a Peronis ticket, but he's pro-mining. Um, you know, we've sort of had feedback from the mining minister in San Juan, which is basically his instructions are to do absolutely everything he can to um, get new mines up and running because really where else uh, is Argentina going to get $6 billion worth of, you know, foreign currency every year? And, you know, a good example of that is we had a, a toll treatment approach for our oxides and um, we had a conversation with the mining ministry and someone and the response was, look, if you guys um, can get a toll treatment deal done and you want to do it, we'll uh, give you all the approvals to basically move your tails and some of the oxide ore in three or four weeks. So I don't see a risk at all. Ecuador... You know, where we're lucky is that El, El Oro province, where we are in the south, the major industry there is mining. Um, Port of Elo has been a mining centre for really you know, the last 100 years and the province is pro-mining. Um, you know, having said that, the key in Ecuador is you've got to have an Ecuadorian team. You've got to really do the environmental work correctly. You've got to have a social, work, you know, social worker. So, you know, look, Ecuador, do I see a risk? No, I don't. Um, when you negotiate your final sort of contracts of work, you lock in the um, fiscal terms for the life of the project. And recently the government has come out and they've removed the super profits tax they had. So they are pro-mining as well. Uh, next question, Bianca. Absolutely. Uh, next question here. Uh, Mario wants to know, do you have Ecuadorian offices? How can uh, you be reached in order for local companies um, to, to reach you or I guess uh, also locals generally to reach you? Yeah, no, look, we do. Um, in Ecuador, we've got a team of, um, and I'm a great believer in you've got to have a local team and be part of the community. We've got uh, six geologists in Ecuador. Our office is in Tarata, which is about 5Ks from site. Uh, we run under the banner of EMSA, which is Ecuadorian Mining Company. And uh, we've got a staff there, including sort of field assistants. And, um, you know, we've got some admin people of around about, you know, 20 20 staff full time. If he wants to send you an email, um, you know, I'm happy to pass on the details there in country. Excellent. Um, Michael Silver uh, wants to know where do you, the assays get done? How quickly do results, uh, at what cost per assay? And are you considering getting your own drilling rigs? <laughs> That's exactly the type of question I would expect an ex mining engineer like Michael to ask. <laughs> um, okay. So assays are uh, currently done. We use ALS for both um, Argentina and Ecuador. This sort of standard 40 element to assay suite with a gravimetric finish is costing us about $37 per assay. And we generally, look, we, we do with logically in Argentina, uh, Ecuador, we're generally doing sort of, you know, two to four med splits. So it's only costing us 10 to $20 a metre. Um, the, uh, in Argentina, we use the lab in Mendoza, who at the moment are flying the pulps up to Vancouver. We talk with them every day about, um, you know, what is the quickest way. And at the moment, that is still the quickest way while the um, backlog in their main lab in Peru clears. In uh, Ecuador, we're actually at the moment using SGS rather than ALS, who we will use simply because SGS seem to have less of a backlog. So, you know, we submit the core, the, um, the core in Quito, they've got a sample prep lab, and then they actually run it through their SGS lab in, in Peru, which seems to be much quicker. And again, that's a similar cost. I think it's $39 per assay for uh, you know, your standard 40 elements with a gravimetric finish. Great. Uh, Brian Warren wants to know, are you advocating for tier two investing in gold ore? Um, I'm actually not quite sure what that question means. Sorry. I don't know either. By all means, Brian, if you want to jump back in with an explanation, go for it. Uh, in the meantime, though, we'll, we'll jump in with Bernie's question here. Uh, he says, hello, Chris, question from Ecuador. Congrats first on the great work at the highly prospective El Oro province. Uh, can you provide a bit of background on your JV partners in Ecuador? Yeah, so look, our JV partner on the original concession is actually an Ecuadorian company that's owned by a Portuguese national. So they were producing about a thousand ounces of year, uh, gold a year. And our JV partner in the larger, you know, the other concession where we've recently announced that gold discovery, 
that is a local Ecuadorian company that I think was backed by some money out of China. But they, uh, it's called Gold King SA. Uh, they have a team on the ground of about 150 miners um, producing about 10,000 ounces a year, gold and silver and concentrate, which they're shipping back to uh, China, I think. But, you know, the, the ownership in that company is part Ecuadorian and part uh, Chinese investors. Great. A uh, question here from Jim Carl. Uh, will this presentation slash recording be available on your website? I was 12 minutes late and would like to hear the first part. Um, yes, it will be. And as soon as uh, Bianca gets, gets us the link, we'll uh, get that up on our website. Absolutely. That's something I can uh, shed some light on. We'll be aiming to get this all mapped out and, and uh, edited and in a recording for you in the next 24 hours. And then, uh, yeah, we'll be sure to get it to your way, Jim. All right, jumping into another question here. Uh, Matt Johnson says, great presentation, Chris. To summarize, we will have an announcement today on uh, Wally Land results and then the results of assays to follow every two weeks. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the reassays of existing holes from Colorado V will continue to come through in the next couple of weeks. What is your expectation on these reassays? Uh, yeah, look, so 100% correct. So, you know, we're now seeing that backlog being cleared. So I would hope that every two or three weeks we'll put out a bunch of, and look, we're not going to put out individual holes in Argentina. You know, we're in the middle of an 80 hole program. So I think, you know, the smallest number we want to put out is eight to 10. Um, you know, really we sort of put out the first eight here simply because, you know, to demonstrate to the market we are getting assays. Um, you know, in Colorado V, my expectations, you know, th this hole that we assayed first was one of the ones where we had more um, assaying done by the Chinese. And what we found was um, basically over the higher grade zones, their results were fairly spot on. And over the sort of lower grade zones, they were generally 0 0.2 per gram you know, higher than normal. We think they'd sort of smeared the assays. Um, you know, look, uh, and visually only, you know, the, the next sort of five holes, we've got two holes out of the, the next five that look sort of similar or better to this hole visually. And, you know, look, I suppose I preface that by saying, you know, I've assayed a lot of cores that look, you know, really fantastic and exciting and you don't get assay results. And conversely, that hole 20 in Wally Lam that went um, eight metres at 21, when we looked at that, we went, oh, yuck, that's not really exciting. So you never know until you assay. But, um, you know, what do I think? Yes, I think these next seven holes, we'll get a couple that aren't as good and we should get a couple that are as good or better. That, you know, and that will give us a feel for, you know, what the project is. Excellent. A uh, question here from Hugo. How easy is it to get to the mining area uh, and have workers on site? Uh, yeah, so look, in Argentina, very simple. I mean, we fly, you know, well, I fly into Mendoza and then it's about a three and a half hour drive. Uh, we've got most of our work is in Argentina. In Argentina, we've got three local geos. We've got a camp manager. We've got a driller that we've got um, contractors managing the drilling and they all live in San Juan. So it's an hour and a half from site. When they're there, they all stay in Los Flores, which is about 15, 20 k's north of the project. And really, it's a 15, 20 minute drive along a double lane sealed highway. That sort of photo you're seeing now, just out of shot on the left, is a double lane sealed highway that um, your barrack pay to maintain because it's the road they get their staff in and out of San Juan City um, to Veladero on. So, you know, really simple. It's actually very good logistics. I mean, you know, the Australian equivalent is basically, you know, Wally Lan would sit an hour and a half drive out of Kalgoorlie in WA. In Ecuador, um, you know, again, it's it's quite easy. We fly into Tarada Airport from Quito, or we fly into Guayaquil, and then Guayaquil, it's a three and a half hour drive to site. Uh, our office is in Tarada Town, which is a little town of about 500 people. We've got an office and six apartments there that all the staff stay at, and it's literally a 10 minute drive. Um, the last two Ks are on a fairly rough dirt track. But a um, yeah, 10 minute drive from the office to get to site. So it's really good logistics in both. Great. Uh, Jim wants to know will the stock be available on any of the US exchanges? Um, in the short term, no, it won't. Um, I'm a sort of firm believer in that, you know, just because you list on NASDAQ doesn't mean you get valued at a, a silly multiple. And generally in this day and age, with, you know, for retail investors or you know, institutions, most institutions have the ability to trade on any exchange and really as a retail investor, some of the platforms now like interactive brokers, you can basically trade on any exchange anyway. So no, there is no sort of you know, near term plan to be listed on you know, one of the US exchanges. Great. 
Uh, another question here, how big do you think the Wally Lund Gold System can ultimately be? Um, yeah, good question. Um, look, yeah, the 600,000 ounces that are there now is basically 20% of the footprint area. Um, you know, if you look at that actual system, the extreme southern end of the resource has more copper. It's a higher temperature assemblage. So we think the southern end is where the actual source is. So, you know, if you want to you know, take the you know, the upside case, you take that 600,000 ounces, you double it and roll it round to the south again, and then you say, well, well that's, you know, 20% of the footprint. I mean, it could be a monster system. We, we really will know in 12 months whether this thing is 600,000 ounces going on a million or whether it's 600,000 ounces going on, you know, a couple of million, three million ounces or more. You know, we really just got to get in there and, and you know, we, we need to drill another four or 500 holes to, to know exactly how big it is. But, you know, do I think it's more than a million? Yes. Could it be three or four? Yes. Great. Uh, question here from Derek McComer. He wants to know how quickly could you have a JORC on uh, Colorado IRGS. Yeah, um, uh, Colorado V. So we've got all of the drill core. We're planning on reassaying all of that now. That'll take us about three months. And then really, we may need to twin one or two holes. But there's no reason why we can't have a, a jork resource on Colorado V in that area that's been you know, drilled up by the small scale miners within the next you know, three months, um, maybe four, you know, that, that is the aim. We'll, we'll push, push, push to get all that core reassayed. And then if we think we need to twin a couple of holes, then we'll do that. But you know, definitely by the end of the year, we can get a, a resource out there that, you know, I think, you know, will it be, you know, more than 60 million tonnes? Yes. The only real question is what grade does it go? Mm -hmm. On a similar vein, uh, Matt Johnson's asking, so the focus in Ecuador is Colorado V over L. Guayabo in the short term. Yes, it is. And, you know, that's not because I, I don't really love the targets we've got in El Guayabo. It's simply, you know, I've got a choice here where I can drill, you know, 1,000 metre holes at $300, $400 a metre, and I probably need to drill 20 before I get into something. Or for $20 a metre, I've got 60 holes there that really we look at half of those and they're quite exciting. And, um, you know, so it, it's a case of I can either spend $6 million or I can spend, you know, a couple of hundred thousand dollars to get the same result. And, you know, look, El Guabo is a really prospective and I think there'll be a couple of big porphyry systems there. But really, that's a case of let's get six months worth of, you know, strong news out of Argentina and Colorado V, you know, get the stock significantly higher and then I'll take 20 or $30 million and, and do a proper drill out program in El Guabo. Great. Um, Brad Atkinson wants to know, hi, Chris, great presentation. Are you still undergoing any issues with COVID at either of the sites? Also, I uh, would like to know what you might see as the biggest headwind for Challenger going forward. Uh, yes, yeah, so look, in, in terms of COVID in Argentina, there have only been two cases in San Juan province. And you know, that was because the Argentinian government acted very early and very aggressively and you know, all of their province borders in Argentina and the actual, you know, external border is still closed. If you want to travel between provinces, um, you need a, it's a two week quarantine. Uh, for us, that doesn't affect us at all. I mean, basically, you know, again, the model is having local geos on site. We've got three really good gold geos who are all multilingual, bilingual. So we're using San Juan based drilling companies. So, you know, it doesn't affect us at all. We're sort of still drilling. The only sort of impact on the drilling has been that because we've only got the two crews, um, we give them 10 days on, then four days off rather than rotating another crew to get around the quarantine. We've got approval to uh, basically transport the core across the border to Mendoza. Where it's affected us has been the assays, um, and that looks like it's starting to come good given we've got a bunch of sort of, you know, six holes you know, 48 hours ago. Um, in terms of Ecuador, different story. You know, the stories you hear about dead bodies lining the streets in um, in um, Guayaquil are correct. Uh, we're back to work now. We're lucky in that we're effectively a small country town that is, you know, 150 k's from the centre of it. Uh, we're careful. We've got all of the COVID protocols in place. Everyone's wearing masks. And really, because we're isolated, we've got sort of, you know, a team of three GOs and fieldies that live in the community that are purely focusing on logging and, and sampling the core for assaying. And then that core is transported commercially up to um, 
up to keto for assay. So you know, we're being careful. It costs us two months, but we're back in the field now. Great. Uh, Michael Silver wants to know, uh, well, first he comments, Chris, indeed a good presentation. Um, apart from you, who is your chief ge geological consultant? Yeah, so look, I've got an exploration manager, uh, Stuart Munro, who is, uh, he was SRK's sort of gold project manager. He um, did the initial sort of, you know, pre-IPO work and DD on the project. And I could tell there that he wasn't an SRK guy. He you know, looked at me and said, geez, you can have a lot of fun with these projects. So, yeah, uh, a bit of perseverance, we picked up Stuart. So Stuart is our exploration manager. He's got 20 years in the industry. He's been an exploration manager of small companies before. Uh, we've got a sort of technical consultant, John King, out of the US, who we fly in and fly out, who sort of does some senior level advising. John is in his sort of early 70s, but there is no substitute for someone who's spent 40 years looking at, at core. So, you know, when we've got something, we use John. We've also got Luciano um, Bocanegra, who is a really well-known South American porphyry consultant. Uh, we get Luciano there two or three weeks every sort of three or four months to have a look at what we're doing. And then, you know, the team we've got in Ecuador, there's six geos there, you know, three of them are Western trained. So you've got some good geologists there. And uh, then, you know, same thing in Argentina. We've got three geos there that are, you know, Western trained and, and really good geos. So we, we've got a pretty round team. But, you know, where we're lucky is because we've got quality, you know, Argentinian and Ecuadorian geos, we really don't need, you don't need me on site there. You know, they, they can run the whole thing smoothly without me getting to site. You know, having said that, as soon as travel restrictions are lifted, then I do tend to spend half my life there just because you've got to. Are uh, you there, Bianca? Ah, yes, I am. Sorry, my yes. audio must have cut out just for a second, but I am here and we have more questions. Um, this one's from Matt Johnson and he wants to know, do you think Colorado and El Guayabo are linked? Uh, yeah, we do. I mean, if you look at, we sort of reassayed some holes in El Guayabo. We didn't make a song and dance about it because they were assayed by Newmont, but there's a hole there that went 150 metres at two and a half grams a tonne gold. And if you sort of go back to that slide I showed of Colorado V where you've got the extensions on that soil antimony map down to the, uh, the sort of bottom right of page, if you go another sort of two and a half kilometres down that, down that sort of, you know, zone, that's where that um, 150 metres of two and a half gram gold intercept sits. So I think you've got, you know, a big sort of, you know, this thing is controlled by this big main regional structure. So, yeah, look, I, I think they're a similar system. Whether or not they're a porphyry system is still to be known. It, you know, it, it's, we think it's going to be a bit like Kang Rios, hopefully higher grade because we've got that sort of an extra early phase of copper mineralisation in the system that they don't have. Great. Uh, Derek McComer wants to know, uh, any potential JV partners for deeper porphyry targets at El Guayabo having a look at data? Uh, look, we've had one approaches, you know, I mean, they tend to kick a lot of tyres in Ecuador. The challenge I've got is the moment that I farm that package out to a major, I'm a hostage, I've got 25 or 30 or 20 percent depending on how I do my deal and then I'm purely a price taker. You know, that is not the aim here. I mean, you know, what we'll do is, you know, we're lucky that we've got a second project that will carry expenditure in Ecuador. So really the plan is once we've got 20 to 30 in the bank, we'll spend 15 doing a you know, high impact program in Ecuador. And then if we get into it and find out it's not there, rather than spend another $50 million trying to prove that I was right and I'm smart, you walk away. So no, look, I think when, when a major comes into Ecuador, it's hopefully to you know, partner with us to put it in production or to take us out. I'm certainly not gonna give away the farm now simply because, um, you know, if I didn't have a second project, I'd have no choice. But no, that's not the plan now. We've got you know, some world-class targets there that I'd like to drill and capture all the upside for shareholders. Mm -hmm. Speaking of, uh, Derek wants to know, at uh, Wallyland, the centre of the system is further south than previously thought. What is the tenement boundary situation? Uh, you said mineralization continued five kilometres south. How far is the boundary? Yeah, so to the south, we've got around about four kilometres of strike uh, covered. And then to the north, we go about, uh, I think it's about three and a half, four. So, you know, we're quite well covered in terms of the minas that we've got. 
Um, the way amina works in Argentina is if you demonstrate mineralization extending down dip, you're automatically granted an adjoining mina. So, you know, technically I don't need the EL. I mean, I just don't fancy explaining that to the Australian market. So, look, we've got, you know, three and a half, four Ks strike either side of um, of the project at the moment. Having said that, we're in discussions with the um, chaps who own further north and further south at the moment as well because we've got a window to increase the footprint there, which is a smart thing to do. Great. At this point, we have one more question, and then I will throw it back to you, Chris, for the final word. Um, final question here is, what are you looking forward to the most in terms of the events will unfold in the next month or so? Uh, yeah, look, I mean, I suppose most people would say assay results out of um, out of Colorado B, and I am going to be excited to see those. And, you know, I think the next half a dozen holes will really paint a picture that we've got a very big gold system that... Um, you know, it, it is going to have a lot of upside. Uh, for me, I'm probably more interested in uh, the metallurgical results we're going to get out of um, Wally Lan. You know, I think if all of a sudden we're getting, you know, high 80s, 90% um, recovery rather than sort of, you know, 80% recovery, that is where you go from being a low cost to an ultra low cost um, project. And also from an institutional point of view, you know, they've sort of made it loud and clear known to us that really they're looking for the metallurgy to be done before you sort of start to see some significant institutional presence on the register as well. So, yeah, I'm actually more you know, excited by what we get back with the metallurgical testing and hopefully that gives us a very nice surprise. Great. I know I said last question, but we just have one last one sneak in here if, if you're game for it, Chris. Yeah, sure. Great. Uh, this one is from Stephen Light. He says, hi, Chris. Great presentation, mate. Uh, any update or progress with Karoo in South Africa? And if not, would you consider selling to raise funds? Uh, so, look, there's been a number of updates. The Karoo, for those that don't know, is that's a legacy asset in Challenger. It's a, um, a shale gas concession in the Karoo Basin in South Africa. It's sort of ranked in the top eight um, shale gas provinces in the world. There's a, you know, the US Geological Survey have come in and, and basically put a you know, prospective resource in Challenger's concession there at you know, around about 5 TCF, and that is only from the lower part of the concession. Uh, so it's a world-class asset. Challenger had a $100 million farm out deal done six years ago when it looked like that concession was being awarded, and really they ran out of time, and that's uh, why these projects had to go in. Um, would I sell it now? No. Um, we've had offers, but we'd probably end up with a half a million or a million dollars worth of shares in a... Um, uh, a small company, once it's awarded and granted, and I can't tell you if that's in the next six months or six years, then totally different story. I mean, it doesn't fit with our assets in South America, but we certainly want to get the best value for shareholders. So, you know, really, it doesn't cost us anything. It's a free option until the concession is granted. And then once the concession is granted and hopefully we've got a 30 or $40 million asset, then we'll actually deal with it rather than um, you know, try to move it along now for a half a million dollars worth of shares and something. Great. And with that, we're going to wrap up the investor Q&A period. A big thank you to everyone who attended and everyone who submitted their questions. If for whatever reason we didn't get to your question or you had a question you couldn't ask here, uh, feel free to reach out either to us directly at friends at six.com and we'll send it along to Chris or you can reach out to Challenger Exploration uh, directly. And without further ado, I'm going to pass along to you, Chris, for the final word. Yeah, look, I'd just like to thank everyone for listening. And again, if there are any more questions, feel free at the bottom of our ASX releases. And there'll be one this morning you can get from the ASX platform at asx.com.au or our website. I'm happy if you send me an email. You know, as the CEO, basically, you know, I get the companies owned by shareholders and you know, my job is to work for shareholders. So if anyone's got any more questions, more than happy to have a conversation or answer questions via email. You know, I'm excited by what's happening and really I think the next three months is probably going to be a very exciting next three months for Challenger. So thank you everyone for your time. Great. Thanks and take care.